You're listening to Inside Air, a behind-the-wire view of the Royal Air Force, its people, technology and operations. Hello, I'm Squadron Leader Peter Lisney, and in this episode, we hear from the new boss of the Central Flying School. We'll also reheat a few stories, just in case you missed them, but first... See if you can identify this noise. Find out if you're right at the end of this episode. Now, the Central Flying School has been around for almost as long as powered aviation itself. I caught up with the Commandant, Group Captain Mike, to find out what they do today and to hear his vision for the future. You can't be a robot as an instructor in the aircraft. You have to adapt. You have to be personal to your trainee. I think the biggest curveball is the difference between how fixed wing and rotary wing instruct. Everything we do is about making the trainee better. We're going to talk about the Central Flying School, but before we get into that, I would like you to tell me about your experience of learning to fly in the Royal Air Force. Of course. Uh, so it goes back a long, long time. Feels a lot longer every day that goes on. Uh, so I think the first time that I flew uh, in the Air Force uh, was really as an air cadet. Um, I was the original space cadet and I was a member of the Air Training Corps and the Combined Cadet Force that I was lucky enough to have with school. So uh, I remember gliding uh, at Abingdon Airfield in a vigilant motor glider. Uh, I remember doing my basic glider training uh, at Harlavington, which is one of the homes of CFS, um, as I say, a long time ago now. Um, but that really gave me a sort of a love for flying. Um, and then I was lucky enough to become a staff cadet on an air experience flight when the chipmunk was around. So I used to toddle up from Reading every weekend up to Benson. And then if I looked after the air cadets, I was given the luxury of a flight in a chipmunk at the end of it. And that really set the tone. Uh, I did an awful lot with the air cadets before I even joined the Air Force. And I was very lucky. Um, I, I managed to somehow convince the system to sponsor me through sixth form and then sponsor me through university. And so I went into officer training and then uh, elementary flying training, um, having had a good deal of experience of flying with the air cadets. Uh, so very, very lucky. Now, to make this relevant to what we're going to talk about today, what was your relationship like with your instructors? Once you'd gone through Cranwell, once you had completed initial officer training, you're into your flying training. And, and give us a clue, roughly what sort of era are we talking about here? <laughs> so we're talking late 90s. Uh, I think it was 1999, about May, that I went into the Defence Helicopter Flying School at Shawbury. So I was very lucky that uh, I'd done my elementary flying training at university on the University Air Squadron. So I'd managed to convince the system that I should be a helicopter pilot. And I think probably the system knew that I was only ever going to be at best average as anything other. Um, so off I went to Shawbury. Um, and the instructors that I had all the way through flying training at Shawbury were outstanding. I don't remember one bad instructor at Shawbury. Um, they were all incredibly experienced. I remember looking at them and thinking, how on earth are you still flying at the age you are? But they did, and they were brilliant. You know, some of them made us laugh, and they, they really entertained us whilst they were giving us exceptional flying training. And I think it made me realise the personal element of flying instruction, that you can't be a robot as an instructor in the aircraft. You have to adapt. You have to be personal to your trainee. Um, and I think really the... I started to think about becoming a flying instructor um, when I was coming towards the end of my flying training and I went off to a specialist unit uh, that taught us search and rescue techniques. And I struggled, I'll be honest. Uh, there was one particular manoeuvre that I just could not do. And of course, all trainees get really tense. And in a helicopter, if you're really tense on the controls, it just makes things a hundred times worse. And this instructor, for some reason, couldn't get the message across and I continually kept messing up this manoeuvre. And we reached a point where I was put onto what we call an air warning, which is just to highlight that I was having a problem to give me a little bit more attention. But the next day I flew then with the squadron boss 
uh, I think it was irrelevant that he was the squadron boss. He just happened to be an instructor. But within 30 seconds, he was able to lay, allow me to do the manoeuvre. And it was simply because he understood me. He'd taken the time to understand me. And he was able to identify what my problem was. And it was put simply that I was gripping the controls too strongly. And that was definitely the point, looking back now, at which I thought, I want to be able to do that. I want to be able to help someone who's struggling. I want to be able to teach them something. But more importantly, I want to think of them as a person rather than as a robot. Now, that instructor that uh, gave you that penny drop moment, were they part of the Central Flying School? Had they no, gone through but, that process? So they had all gone through the Central Flying School indeed. So all flying instruction instructors in the UK military have gone through a Central Flying School instructor's course. It's all in regulation, but to teach UK military trainees, you have to be a qualified service pilot and you have to be uh, a qualified instructor. That's qualified helicopter instructor uh, within the helicopter world, clearly qualified flying instructor in the fixed wing world. And of course, we've got all sorts of uh, qualified instructors in the specialist stream. So we have mission specialists, for example, we have qualified helicopter crewmen instructors. Um, but they, the important thing is they've all gone through the Central Flying School. And it's an important thing to note, I think, that the Central Flying School is not just the Royal Air Force. Although I happen to wear a light blue uniform, I've got people who work with me within the Central Flying School from all three services. And um, a lot of our training is done with all three services. So, yeah, a, a really, really good system um, that allows risk to be mitigated, to go a bit serious for a second. Um, but more importantly, that really trains our people thoroughly and professionally. OK, that's interesting, Group Captain Mike, uh, because I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, this was an army idea to set up the CFS. Is that right? Well, yeah, you look at the history. I think it was a bit of army and navy banter, wasn't it? Um, so uh, I looked into this earlier to make sure I got my data right for you. Uh, May 1912 was when the Central Flying School was formed down in Wiltshire uh, at Uphaven. And sometimes the Central Flying School goes back to Uphaven to celebrate our history. Uh, but you're absolutely right. At the time, it was the Royal Flying Corps it, with the army effectively and the Royal Naval Air Service. And there was banter between the two services about who should be in charge. And I think they came to the conclusion that it should be a naval boss, but it was the army who was providing the uh, the, the money behind it. Um, but right from the start of that organisation, you've got the two services at that point, And then 1st of April 1918, Royal, um, Royal Air Force formed. And it's, it's, the point is, it's been a tri-service organisation for as long as it could have possibly been. I mean, let's, let's go back to 1912. Let's go back to 1911. What was it that was, uh, what were the issues, do you believe, that made them decide that there needed to be um, uh, standards within uh, flying training? Well, it, initially, it wasn't even standards. It was uh, simply that they realised they needed a professional corps of aviators. So the Flint Central Flying School wasn't actually established to simply train instructors, it was to train pilots. I think with the, the coming of the war, um, the, Air Min or the, the war ministry could sense that they needed professional people in all the different services. And so the Central Flying School was stood up. Um, Godfrey Payne was a, uh, a naval captain. Um, but you look at the, the people who were involved in the Central Flying School from the outset, you've got Payne, as I say, as the boss. You've got a man called Salmond, who became Marshal of the Royal Air Force not that long later. You've got Lord Trenchard, who became the first Chief of the Air Staff, um, and a man who's very, very dear to our, our world, Smith Barry, um, and I'm sure we'll talk about his legacy later on. So a hugely eminent uh, number of people in that organisation. But in answer to your question, I think it was because they could sense war was coming and they recognised that we needed to do aviation properly. Well... Good, good ideas stick around a long time. We're now 110 years on uh, yeah. fr from the founding. And could you tell us what constitutes the Central Flying School today? Because we've we've got the uh, military flying training system. There's a lot of elements of Royal Air Force training that have been contracted out. Mm -hmm. uh, so it'd be interesting to know how it looks today. Of course. So... The Central Flying School consists of uh, two main areas. Um, our headquarters is at Cranwell in Lincolnshire, but we've got um, people within the Central Flying School um, directly serving at each of the flying training schools. Um, 
we've got three main jobs. Um, predominantly, and what we're known for is training instructors. And that makes us different to the military flying training system, the MFTS that you've just mentioned. The MFTS is all about training trainees to be military aviators, whereas the Central Flying School's raison d'etre is to train instructors. And of course, our output then go into the schools and go on to teach. The two main areas, uh, we have exam wing, um, who, as the name suggests, go out and examine, albeit I think less examining these days and more helping, assisting, advising, supporting, developing. Their job predominantly is to assure flying instructional standards. So anyone who's gone through a CFS accredited instructor course will need to be assured at some point. And that's to maintain the instructional standards that we're hugely proud of and we're globally recognised for as well. And Exam Wing do that in the UK. They do it within number 22 group uh, where all the flying training happens, but they also do it on the front line. Um, and it's important to note that we're not just a training organisation. We are operating with the front line and we pride ourselves on trying to develop uh, the operational thought process to help the front line. Because ultimately, all trainees uh, who go to join aviation world will go and be operational in some form. You know, and we're under no doubt that our job is to train the warfighter, to use that, that phrase. So that's exam wing. Then we have a secondary wing uh, called the development and uh, delivery wing at, um, based at Cranwell. And that's got two bits to it. The first, and we come back to this man, Smith Barry. So the Smith Barry Academy is where we teach um, flying instructional techniques on the ground. So all the future instructors will do a couple of courses with the Smith Barry Academy. And it's all about developing their thought processes, allowing them to understand human performance, particularly, which is where we're really investing a lot of time and effort. So that's the Smith Barry who also have an innovation area as well. And I'm sure we'll talk about that at some point in this evening. Um, and then there's another area as well of uh, development and delivery wing, which is the Central Fly School Helicopter Squadron, who train all rotary wing, all helicopter uh, air crew instructors uh, based over at Shawbury. So that's the, uh, the rotary side of things. Uh, tell me about the fixed wing and your relationship with the fixed wing instructors. So the, the way that the system works in the fixed wing is that uh, we have what's called or known as sea flights. So they are CFS people who are based at the flying training school and they train instructors, but predominantly they are part of the flying training school. So we would call them CFS agents. Um, now, some of those would also be within the exam wing, but the delivery of flying instruction is not simply done just by CFS people. It's a real relationship with the flying training uh, schools. So, Group Captain Mike, you have just started this role recently, I understand, in the last couple of weeks, but you've known about it for a few months. You've been able to go on a fact-finding mission overseas. What have you learned from our NATO allies and partners about how they deliver the same sort of training? Uh, a number of things, I think. Um, the first is uh, that we should be absolutely hugely proud within the military that we have the Central Flying School. We are world recognised and world renowned. And I don't say that to be selfish. I do it because I'm incredibly proud to be involved in this organisation. But I think it is a jewel in the crown. Um, so to answer your question, I learnt that the CFS are respected, that uh, the way we train instructors is absolutely world leading. Um, I learned that uh, we have a whole variety of techniques at our disposal, uh, that we're flexible, that we adapt. Um, and I do think we set the example for flying instruction around the world. But then, of course, I would say that, wouldn't I? How, how, how do you think Top Gun's Maverick would fit into the system? Would he get a good uh, OJAR, a good annual report from you? So my wife bantered me recently because I've had the luxury in my career of being a test pilot at one point as well. And she said, you're a, you're a maverick. At which point my son answered and told me that fast jets were much cooler than helicopters and I definitely wasn't a Maverick. <laughs> uh, so uh, I'm not sure that Maverick would have fitted in. Uh, the clue's in the name. Um, I don't think he would have been the best instructor in the world. Um, but hey, 
it would be interesting to fly Tom Cruise in a CFS aircraft. It certainly would. Um, so th- there must have been things you picked up on your travels there that uh, could influence the you going forward. Obviously, you know, no one's going to hold you to account anything you say here. But um, is there is there any th- inspiration that you you had for overseas that you'd like to see us adopt? Um. Yes and no. And that's not a political answer. It's a genuine, there are some things I would, some things I wouldn't. So I think what you're referring to is um, my, I I went last week to Texas. I was very lucky to be able to attend the uh, International Military Flying Training Conference. And it was really focused on the US Air Force and the US Navy, who are both developing their flying training systems. Um, So what did I take away from that? I took away that People coming into the military come from a different society than that which I came from. Uh, And it was loud and clear to us at the conference that trainees nowadays expect to have information at their immediate disposal whenever they want it, effectively 24 hours a day, because they've grown up with iPhones, which allows them access. Um, I think that's something we need to recognise in our instructional methods that each student deserves effectively a number of different media to be able to um, go through flying training, understand what they're doing and to be the best air crew that they can be. Um, So I think that's something we want to look at is how people learn. We've done that to a degree already. And I, I mentioned earlier about human performance is really important to us. And we are definitely world leading in how we train our instructors to develop people Uh, using some effectively psychological training, psychological skills to involve the trainee and to get the most out of them. That's a a really interesting point because I picked up on your organisation chart that you have a research psychologist on the team. We do. And you need to tell us why. Yeah, so... What what function are they performing and and what are they adding? So Dr John uh, adds so much uh, value. He can buy me a number of beers for saying that, um, but genuinely <laughs> I mean it. Um, you, you are absolutely right that having a, uh, a civilian research psychologist on the staff is something that's you know, it's a bit wacky, a bit out there, isn't it? But it demonstrates that we are quite forward leaning as a military, to be fair, and certainly as the Central Flying School, in that we are we recognise that we as military aircrew perhaps are a stereotype or risk being a stereotype. And so what we're really trying to drive is a thing called cognitive diversity. It's not about having different uh, sexual preferences, different races involved necessarily. It's all about different thinking. And Dr. John keeps us on the straight and narrow um, by making us move away from our stereotype thinking, adding in um, some hugely influential thoughts. So he's got a doctorate in, um, in psychology and sports coaching and the ability to draw from his experience uh, has really allowed that human performance and psychological skills training to be developed. But as a research doctor, he also keeps us on the narrow in terms of doing trials properly. Now, I use the word trials reservedly because as an ex-test pilot, that means something. Um, But what I mean by that is he makes sure that we don't just have a good idea and go out and have a play with something. We do the trial or the proof of concept properly. We gain evidence so that we can have a really good argument and we understand what it is we want to do in the future. And most importantly, what effect that will have on the trainee, because everything we do is about making the trainee better. And so Dr. John keeps us on that straight and narrow. He allows the future to be developed, which is part of our role. Yeah, that sounds really, really good. But Because you're developing a lot of new techniques for delivering training, uh, virtual reality, 360 degree videos. Tell us something about what, what you're doing. You know, you're cutting edge here. Yeah. So, again, uh, reservedly, because these technologies are not uh, being utilised fully on the, the, uh, within the flying training schools yet. But the evidence is there from across the world that uh, the The more different media you can give a trainee, the better. We talk about different means of learning, different ways of learning. You know, you learn in some way, Peter, I'll learn in a different way. And so if we can give the trainee those different media through their flying training, it will allow them to pick the media that they learn best through. And 360 degree uh, footage is, as the name suggests, it's it's a camera, so video. Can we use, do we have videos these days? I don't know. 
But the idea is that we film a flight in whatever aircraft it might be using a 360 degree camera. Afterwards, we would edit that. Uh, we put a, um, an instructor's, um, we call it patter, talking over the top. We would say, you know, where do we want the trainee's eyes to be looking? Do we want them looking at a particular instrument in the aircraft? Do we want them looking at a specific thing on the ground? The idea being that even before they've got into a simulator or an aircraft, they've seen what something looks like. And that can have huge value. I remember going through flying training and I was given books after books after books. And that worked for some people, didn't work for me. So I'd be as good a student as I could be. I'd turn up to the flying. But ultimately, where I first learned was the first time I got airborne because we didn't have the value of this technology. We hope that in the future, by introducing things like 360 degree footage, um, that the trainees are able to access effectively 24 hours a day, it will allow them to prepare in the best way that they can. And from that, that means that the flying that we do, which is expensive, uh, can be more effective. But there is a note here, which is that we're not trying to reduce the amount of flying training we give our people. We're trying to enhance the effectiveness of that flying training. And if there is a cost benefit at the end of it, then so be it. But that's not what our focus is at the minute. But the evidence shows that using these different technologies and 360 degree footage is one, virtual reality is another, there is a positive advantage for the trainee so that when they get airborne, they do better. We don't have to talk as an instructor because effectively they've been taught already before we've even left the ground. And that can only be a good thing. So uh, just to dig a little bit deeper on there, I know uh, time in the sim it, simulator is hugely valuable and expensive and competitive. So uh, do students have their own VR headset? Can they take that um, away or is it all done in the training environment? So currently it is largely done in the training environment. Through the military flying training system, the trainee will get a, a tablet where some information is stored. Uh, we're trying to make that system better and more effective for our trainees because it's not in 100% of cases quite working where we want it to at the minute. Uh, we haven't got to the stage yet where we can give our trainees their virtual reality headsets. Um, what we actually see, I think, in a few years' time is that we would have a virtual reality headset, but it would probably be how we would show them the 360-degree footage rather than them going back to their rooms and flying a virtual reality simulator. Um, the answer is no, they don't have them yet, um, but the evidence is clear that if we can give them a variety of the USAF call it learning modalities, uh, then they will be better. And that's what we want. Now, you're, you're new into the job. How many days in are we? I think we are on day 12 today, of which six were spent in the United States. So I'm a real newbie. <laughs> and uh, I understand you've already met with the team at Cranwell. You've drawn them in from the uh, corners of uh, the UK. How did that meeting go how many were there and how did it go so we had about uh, 35 of the team it's a really small team given the amount of work that we do and the effect that we have we're a really small team um it was a great day uh, i loved having everyone there and being able to talk to them so i wanted to tell them more about me so that they understood me as the boss uh, i wanted to tell them what i've been directed to do um, so that they can understand that and when they go and do their day-to-day -day activities they can have that in the back of their mind but most important for me was that I had the whole team together and they were all able to talk and we had some really good banter between the different areas of flying instruction uh, there were some heated debates I think it would be fair to go say. on then go on then what 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 excited them what were the curveballs uh, <laughs> So the, I think the biggest curveball is the difference between how fixed wing and rotary wing instruct. Uh, ultimately, we're all after the same aim. We're trying to train the trainees to the best of our ability to make them as good as we can be. Um, but in a helicopter, you do things slightly different. It's evolved over the years and some of it, there's evidence for why, some of it not. Um, but it's really interesting when you look at it and to have the luxury of an afternoon and an evening to sit back and consider why we do things in a certain way and whether it's the right way and can we learn from each other and that's the sort of culture that I'm trying to really develop within the Central Flying School is that despite the fact that we might have very differing roles we're going to talk together and the guys and girls all talk to each other as it stands but I think we can learn from each other and my vision for the organisation is definitely to be a learning innovative organisation because by doing both of those things 
we will positively impact the future of the flying instructional environment, which is part of our job, job to do. Yeah, it was really positive. Uh, everyone is enthused about what they do. They're already incredibly passionate about what they do for a living uh, and what our role is, because the word I used yesterday to describe what we do as flying instructors is huge privilege to be able to positively impact the future, to be able to train some very, very talented individuals in the flying training system. It's a huge privilege. Uh, and I think that's to sum up what the CFS thinks. It is that word privilege. So you draw your instructors from the front line, I presume, uh, experienced excellent pilots. I remember when I was stationed at Valley, um, it was the uh, creamies, they were called. They were taken off um, flying uh, training and uh, one or two became instructors straight away. I don't know if that still happens today. Yeah, it does. Um, so there are effectively two streams to becoming an instructor. There are those from the front line. I was one of those. I came from an operational helicopter squadron uh, and went through the CFS helicopter course. You're right. Within the fixed wing world, there are um, what we would call creamies uh, who um, fly in both Hawk and in the Texan aircraft up at Valley. And we are just about to embark on uh, considering how we can have rotary wing creamies as well, which is a a controversial topic because it's never been done before. But as we are a forward-leaning organisation looking to the future, this is something we need to consider, um, whether or how we best train people to be instructors. Uh, so it's going to be a really fascinating time. For uh, an instructor that comes into CFS, what would you say their perception of CFS is before they become part of the team? You know, is there this us and them? Or how do they look upon CFS? I can't tell you what the average student instructor thinks now because I haven't asked them directly I can give you my own experience perhaps which is it was something I'd wanted to do for a long time uh, it was something I was very proud to be going to do because you have to be positively selected to go on the course uh, there's a certain amount of trepidation because certainly for those coming from the front line you know you are seen as an experienced dude or dudette uh, going into the system and so you don't want to mess up, do you? You don't want to put your head above the parapet and then not be as good as people think you are. So I think trepidation is probably something that people think about going in. But definitively, all of the instructors who work with me try so hard to work at the personal level that as far as we ever can do, I think there is no divide between us and them as you describe them. Now, I would be naive to think that there is no us and them. But my point is, we recognise that as a problem. We try so, so hard to reduce that, recognising that they're all talented individuals who've done a lot in their front line. And often we end up learning as much from the trainee instructors as the instructors training learn from us, I think. Um, so, yeah, we work really hard. What is your role then in CFS in, in further developing or refining the uh, future of UK military flying training? Uh, we've got um, a, a dedicated role within this Smith Barry Academy that I talked about within the development and delivery wing. Um, the innovation of future technology is one element, but we've already talked about Dr. John and his uh, psychological experience. And so I've explained it to the team that we have three tranches of time. We have the ability to affect flying instruction right here, right now and make it better immediately. We can do that through uh, more techniques than anything else. Then we need to be looking out to about five to 10 years. What's the next technology coming in that we can use? And we've already talked about virtual reality, um, 360 degree footage. Those are the sort of technologies that we're looking at bringing into the flying training system. And then we're looking at what does the flying instructional environment look like after 2035? You only need to read the press, social media to understand that swarming drones is a thing that's going to come in the future. The, the military, the UK, has evolved in Team Tempest. We don't know what Tempest is yet, but we know it's not going to look like the aircraft that we fly right now. And I don't just mean the Top Gun Maverick aircraft that he ejected out of. I mean, we don't know what technology it is. We do know, and this was another message that came loud and clear from America, that as time goes on and with the technology available to us, what we would call stick and rudder skills are going to become less and less important because of automation in the aircraft. And we know that we need to invest more in the people, in their decision making and what we would call airmanship. So we need to look at what that looks like in the future, because if I don't need to train someone hands and uh, feet on sticks and on pedals, 
how do we train them? Because they're still operating in the air and we still therefore need to instruct them. So it's a, as I say, it's a fascinating time to be involved in flying instruction at the minute. I come back to that word. What a privilege to be able to develop the future. Do you know what? I, I, Group Captain Mike, I, I want to just conclude with, I mean, you've talked about your vision uh, for learning and innovation, but uh, how long are you going to be in this tour? Three years, something like that? Is that... So my, my posting order says two years. Perhaps we can speak to my bosses and get me there a bit longer. I would like to stay in the job longer because I think this is one of those jobs where to see through projects, perhaps a bit of longevity works, but who knows what's going to happen. So what would you like aircrew across the Royal Air Force, how would you like them to describe CFS by the end of your term as Commandant? Um, I th I'll take it a step back. I think by the end of my term as Commandant, I want more people in the military to know about Central Flying School, not because I'm selfish, but because of the huge value that we can bring to the military and to defence. Um, and so we're embarking on an education campaign to tell people what the CFS does, to tell them how proud we are of what we've done and of our heritage, but more importantly, what we're going to do in the future. How can we help them? And so for me, measure of success is that people who otherwise weren't contacting Central Flying School for advice about flying instruction are now contacting us. They see us as the absolute centre of flying instruction. I described it yesterday to the team as the gold standard of flying instruction. We want to be the people who are there to advise, to help, to support all flying instructors and all of the UK military and our partners overseas, if anything to do with flying instruction. Um, and it, it's worth noting that we also have a role in a thing called DAOTO, a, uh, a, an acronym that was new to me. So every day is a school day. DAOTO is what we would have previously thought of as defence engagement. Um, and we go out to countries all around the world and we help them develop their flying instruction. And so another method of um, success for me or a measure of success is that across the world, the CFS name is upheld with pride, but that we have developed other countries' flying training systems as well and helped them to be better flying instructors. For Inside Air, this is Reheat. I'm AS1 Victoria Andrews. The first cohort of Ukrainian soldiers have taken part in a new UK-led military programme, which will train up to 10,000 Ukrainians. Two Squadron RAF Regiment delivered the specialist training, which will give volunteer recruits with little to no military experience the skills to be effective in frontline combat. The RAF has been to Dublin as invited guests of the Irish Air Corps to participate in their centenary celebrations. The Battle of Britain Memorial Flight was escorted in over Dublin by the Irish Air Corps' aerobatic team, the Silver Swallows. Their chief instructor and number two pilot, Commandant Edward Snowden, spoke to Reheat for Inside Air. First of all, it was a privilege. Uh, really, really good, really exciting. Uh, I had to pinch myself once or twice. So we took off out of here. We routed across Dublin City and we met up with the guys there after around five minutes. And the Lancaster, it's a big aircraft, uh, so it was quite easy to spot. And then we uh, formed up with it, had an exchange of comms in the air, and then after that it was pretty straightforward. We flew in as a formation in across Dublin City, up to Liffey, and overhead here into Paldonald to all our guests uh, for Veterans Day. And finally to sport, where RAF aviators are in Birmingham taking part in the Commonwealth Games. AS1 Luke Pollard took home gold as Dave Ellis's guide in the Paralympic triathlete competition. Meanwhile, in beach volleyball, Group Captain Jeff Brock is a technical officer and Flight Lieutenant Keith Sparrow a lead scorer. On the squash court, squadron leader Phil Ray is a referee and Flight Lieutenant Ian Ireland is the boxing team leader and director. That's Reheat on Inside Air. I'm AS1 Simon Ross with this episode's Name That Noise. That was the sound of a Westland Sea King HAR3. 
For many, the bright yellow silhouette of the Sea King was a familiar and reassuring sight for holidaymakers in coastal and mountain areas. It entered RAF service in 1978 with 202 Squadron, where it provided search and rescue cover for both military and civilian personnel across the UK. This particular Sea King, XZ597, was one of a small number of aircraft to be painted in dark grey for additional duty in the post-war Falkland Islands. Replacing the Whirlwind and the Wessex, the Sea King's rear bulkhead was moved nearly 2 metres to give a longer cabin, allowing it to carry up to 17 individuals or 6 stretchers. The final RAF Sea King retired in 2015, having provided continuous search and rescue capability for nearly 40 years. That's all for this episode of Inside Air. Please give us a review and subscribe on your favourite podcast app and join us again soon. You've been listening to Inside Air, a behind-the-wire view of the Royal Air Force, its people, technology and operations. If you're serving in the RAF and have a story for us, please speak to your unit media and communications officer. Inside Air is written and produced for the Royal Air Force by RAF Media Reserves.